On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, one of the ships sailing to Gaza has lost an engine and has aborted its mission. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So we've been following this mission since the president announced it back at his State of the Union address. On March 9th, we saw the very first vessel, the U.S. Army vessel Besson, set sail. But now we got word that one of the vessels sailing, the USNS Bobo, one of the military Sealift Command vessels, has lost one of its two engines and has now returned back to Jacksonville. We're going to take a look at the status of this mission, where the vessels are that have been assigned to it, and what new vessels may be heading that way. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So just a quick refresher. The goal here in Gaza, as announced by the president, was to deliver humanitarian aid across the shore. Since the Israelis and Egyptians are holding up delivery of aid to Gaza through the border crossings, through the ports in both those countries, the decision has been made to erect a pier, what is known as a Trident Pier. So under a program the U.S. military runs called Joint Logistics Over the Shore, the military practices landing logistics over the beach. Imagine D-Day plus one, where after the invasion of the beach, you now have to bring the supplies ashore. In this case, what the Army does, specifically the 7th Transportation Group will do, is establish a Trident Pier. This is a long string of causeway barges or ferries that are strung together and literally rammed up on the beach. They are then anchored into position, and that pier will extend out of, from the beach into the water. Now, it's not big enough or deep enough to bring large vessels alongside. So instead, what you're going to have to do is shuttle cargo to the pier from an offshore facility. So this is known as a roll-on, roll-off discharge facility, or an RRDF. The U.S. military loves their acronyms. Literally, you take the same causeway ferries that you use to build the the pier and you stick them together into a large massive cube and now you can moor ships alongside of it you can actually lower uh, ramps onto them and you can shift cargo from larger vessels onto this facility and then put them on board watercraft barges or army watercraft and run it ashore roll on roll off discharge facility be, be about two to three miles off the coast and this will allow commercial vessels along with military vessels to come in and then army and navy watercraft would run everything ashore so the first vessel to arrive was this vessel here the general frank besson uh, frank besson is a logistics support vessel there are eight of them in this class of vessels which is named for besson the ship displaces over four thousand long tons it is 273 feet in length. It draws 12 feet and has a speed of about 11 to 12 knots. Now, this ship sailed from Fort Eustace in Chesapeake, the Chesapeake Bay, on March 9th. What's interesting is this vessel did not sail directly to Crete. So the ship had an eight-day layover in the Azores. And not exactly clear why. I, I don't think they were stopping for empanadas. They were on a humanitarian relief operation. And I don't think shore leave would be the thing in process. More than likely, there was a mechanical or a logistical issue that required them to stop in the Azores. They were able to sail in and sail out without a problem. When the ship did sail, it did uh, depart from the Azores, uh, go out to sea for a bit and do some uh, maneuvers before it proceeded on its voyage. These ships are not exactly the best maintained vessels, and it's not because of the U.S. Army. Let me be clear about that. Just a few years ago, these ships were slated for sail. I mean sail, get rid of them. And so the Army watercraft, along with many of the other vessels we're going to be looking at here, are considered low priority by the Department of Defense, and therefore they are not given probably the requisite maintenance and money needed to ensure the readiness of these vessels, as you're about to see even in more detail here. The next group of Army craft included another LSV. This was the uh, Spec 4 James Lau and three of these vessels. These are LCU-2000s, the Wilson Wharf, the Matamoras, and the Monterey. These are really, really tiny vessels. I can't emphasize this enough. These are small, small, small vessels to go across the Atlantic. Less than 1,000 tons, 174 feet, 42-foot beam. They draw like nine feet of water. They go maybe 10 knots 
if you're lucky. These ships sailed from Fort Eustis, went down to Charleston to the Army base down in Charleston. The Army had taken over the old Navy weapon station in Charleston, loaded equipment, and then set sail across the uh, Atlantic. And they followed a little bit more of a southerly route for good reason. You really don't want to be out there on these vessels in the northern Atlantic, especially at the end of winter and early spring. At the same time, you want to avoid really bad weather. So they were doing a lot of weather avoidance heading over. The Lau, the Monterey, and the Matamoras has arrived in Suda Bay. So they're in Crete. They have joined the Besson over there. However, one of the ships has not. The ships, when they were sailing across, you'll notice on the track line, they have this little kind of gl- kind of groupings here. Uh, they slowed down quite a bit when they were coming across. And all the vessels stopped in the Canary Islands at Tenerife. However, Wilson Wharf did not get underway and is still sitting there. So I'm going to assume that there was some sort of mechanical issue on Wilson Wharf that's holding the ship there in Tenerife. Again, I can't imagine we're giving liberty in the Canary Islands when we're talking about a humanitarian mission. So we had Besson for a week and now Wilson Wharf sitting there for a prolonged period of time. And so they broke out this vessel. This is the motor vessel Roy P. Benavidez. This is a large, medium-speed roll-on, roll-off vessel, or an LMSR. These ships were built after the first Persian Gulf War. They were used for both the Army afloat prepositioning program, the Marine Corps afloat prepositioning program, and to be put into the ready reserve force or a surge sea lift capacity. That's what this vessel is. So they loaded this vessel on deck and below deck with all the equipment they needed for that roll-on, roll-off discharge facility, and the, the pier and send it out. Now, this vessel can steam. It has a max speed of 24 knots, but she trucked about 16 to 18 knots across and actually was the first vessel to get over to Suda Bay. She is actually off Suda Bay right now, cruising around. They actually sailed right past the Army watercraft, which were doing eight to nine knots, in, and this big bo- bad boy came flying past. Uh, I got to imagine they were they were waving at each other. Uh, I got to imagine the army crew was not happy to see the big vessel go by. But uh, this is a massive vessel. The next pair of vessels were broken out by the U.S. Navy's Military Sea Lift Command, the USNS Bobo and the USNS Lopez. These are from a class of five vessels. So back in the 1980s when the U.S. Department of Defense realized it needed to have more of a forward presence, the U.S. Marine Corps decided to station a brigade's worth of equipment afloat on three different squadrons. So three different brigades were set up, one in the Atlantic, one in the Indian Ocean, and one in the Pacific. And they converted eight vessels, and they purpose-built five vessels for what became known as the MPS, the Maritime Prepositioning Ships. The Bobo is the lead vessel of the five purpose-built ships. These ships were built up in Quincy, Massachusetts, have a speed of about 17 knots, uh, twin diesel, medium-speed engines. They are just a jack-of-all-trade. I used to joke that these ships are half roll-on, roll-off ships, half container ships, and half tankers because they actually carried fuel for the Marine. They can actually carry five of these ships, excuse me, uh, four of these ships together can carry the entire equipment for a 16,000-person Marine Expeditionary Brigade short of the aircraft and the personnel. So they're absolutely tremendous in size. One of these vessels can carry the same amount of equipment that's on a Marine Amphibious Ready Group. Now, these ships operated from the mid-1980s until just recently forward deployed. So we're talking about almost 40 years of constant Operation. When I say constant operation, these ships were at sea the entire time. They weren't in port. They had to be underway on 24 hours notice. They would deploy for two and a half years, then come back to Jacksonville, Florida for a maintenance period. They would offload their cargo. They would go get dry docked, and that would be about two, three months, and then they were back out again. So to say that these ships have been, you know, ridden hard and, and, and put away wet is an understatement. Uh, these ships currently are now under military seal of command. They're contract operated by a company called Crowley. But the maintenance on these vessels, much like many of the other vessels, including the Army watercraft, have been deficient, I will tell you. And that becomes abundantly clear coming forward. 
So Lopez and Bobo were activated to carry the equipment for Naval Beach Group 1. The Navy used to have two beach groups, one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast. Well, they got rid of the one on the East Coast. So the one on the West Coast, Navy Beach Group 1, was assigned this mission. And these two vessels are designed to carry Navy watercraft on deck. And so those ships sailed from their East Coast uh, layup berths. They were in a reduced operating status. Sailed down to Blunt Island in Jacksonville, loaded Navy uh, lighterage on board, uh, what's called the Integrated Naval Logistics uh, Lighterage System, and set sail. Both Lopez and uh, Bobo set sail from Jacksonville heading across. Now, the Lopez is in the Mediterranean, uh, just past Malta, heading to Suda Bay, Crete. However, there is an indication that Lopez may have had a little bit of problems. If you notice right here, you can see how the arrows kind of get all together here. That indicates the vessel slowed down. So we're not exactly sure what caused this. However, the most telling issue was the motor vessel, uh, was, the, was the USNS Bobo, which suffered a problem shortly after it left Jacksonville. USNS Bobo set sail from Jacksonville on 9 April, heading eastward, following kind of along the same track line as Lopez. It's on about 11 April that we noticed the problem with Bobo. Bobo is sailing eastward out of Jacksonville at a speed of about 14 knots, when all of a sudden it will suffer a loss of propulsion, a slowdown in speed, a substantial slowdown speed. It actually is going to fall to about five knots. Once it loses that speed, the vessel diverts uh, its course. It begins heading northward and eventually will start sailing back to Jacksonville. As the vessel is sailing back to Jacksonville, uh, limping along on one of its engines is a good thing that this ship has two different engines to operate. Sailing from Jacksonville will be the fireboat alert. Uh, she is dispatched out of Jacksonville to meet the Bobo. So this obviously indicates that the ship had some sort of fire on board. Now, we don't know what type of fire it is to lose an engine. I know these vessels extremely well, having worked the maritime prepositioning program for three years. Obviously, what had happened was isolated to one engine. Uh, if you had a fire of some kind that took out an engine, that could be a fuel leak, a uh, crankcase explosion, uh, could be uh, cylinder heads, who knows. But obviously, the ship had enough power to be able to get back on one engine. However, obviously the concern was that there could be more problems. So it was better to go ahead and dispatch a, uh, a rescue vessel to help and assist in case there was a fire. And there's a good reason for this also. Two weeks ago, a sister ship to Bobo and Lopez had sailed from Mobile, Alabama after completing a shipyard. USNS Button suffered an engine room fire. Severe enough for the uh, crew to abandon the engine room and flood the compartment with CO2, carbon dioxide. The vessel was then towed back into Mobile for repairs. So you have an indication of a fire on the button. You have an issue of slowdown on the Lopez going across. And then you have the fire that takes place or the engine room, uh, engine disability that takes place on Bobo coming in. Uh, let me be clear. This is not sabotage. This is not hacking into vessels. I've been on these ships. There's no way you're hacking into a vessel built in the 1980s. This is dealing with preventive maintenance and allocating enough money. This is not the fault of the military seal of command. It's not the fault of Crowley. It is the fault of the fact that we are not putting enough money into ships and we're running ships that are 40 friggin' years old. That's the problem here. So here you see the rendezvous being set up between Bobo and Alert coming out. Again, this is good, prudent mariner's seamanship here. You want it to have safety in mind. Obviously, if you had an issue with an engine, whatever happened to this engine, you want to make sure that there are safety features here in case the ship does have, an, have any problems. You want assistance. Now, I will note that Bobo on the way back in suffers even more problems with losing the plant again. Here you can see a vessel coming in, Bobo, where she may have lost power again, starts to drift. The uh, Gulf Stream would take the vessel. Uh, Alert was with her the whole time. And matter of fact, Alert would escort uh, Bobo back into Jacksonville. This is the image of Bobo uh, departing Jacksonville back on April 1st. So the vessel had just an underway period. So we know the vessel was steaming prior to this. And this is the image of Bobo coming in with alert in front of it 
back into Jacksonville the other day. So let me be clear about something. I am not picking on the Army. I'm not picking on the Navy or Military Sealift Command. I'm trying to highlight a concern that we should all have for the state of our Sealift Army watercraft and really a very essential mission, which is to be able to transport military equipment overseas. Back in 2019, I wrote this piece for G-Captain when the Army was talking about getting rid of its watercraft. It looks like we're going to have to swim for it. Now, fortunately, shortly after this article was written, along with many others, and I had no part in this, the Army backed away from divesting itself of its Army watercraft program. It kept a large chunk of it. However, it is a low-priority issue that has been continually underfunded in the U.S. Army. Add to it, this story I wrote back in 2021 after a test activation of the Ready Reserve Force from which a lot of the ships today, the Ben Vietas, the Bobo, the Lopez, uh, are all going to be a part of. This test activation took place in 2021 after a horrible test activation in 2019, what was called Turbo, Activa uh, Turbo Activation 19 Plus, where they activated 33 of the 61 reserve vessels and found out that instead of 85% of the ships being ready to deploy, only 40% were, were ready. If you look at what we just watched here, you had one of two landing ship vehicles that had a weak layover. Now, supposedly there's another landing ship vehicle on the way over. The Major General Gross, which was heading down to the Caribbean, is now heading over to Rota. So we may have three LSVs heading over there. But if one out of three had a problem, that's an issue. We know one out of the three LCUs had a problem because Wilson Wharf is still sitting in Tenerife and at least one out of three of the MSC Marad ships had a problem. So we're talking about a 66 and two third percent readiness rate. That is not good. That is, that is a D. I'm a college professor. That's a D. That, that's not passing by any means, which means we need to be looking at what are we going to do to invest in this? Because my fear is that we are seeing, this is a good indication for what we could potentially see, should there be a conflict, not over in the Middle East at, at Gaza, but maybe if we have to go across, uh, not just the Atlantic here, but across the entire Pacific, which would be a big major problem. The uh, Army Secretary in a hearing before Congress was shocked, she said, to learn about the state of the Army watercraft when she became Secretary of the Army. And now she's working on a program to recapitalize, to improve the readiness, including building or leasing new vessels. This is a fundamental problem. This is not damning the crews on board by any means. They're doing a fabulous job as best as they can do. This is a systemic problem, and it's not Military Seal of Command, it's not MARAD, it's not Crowley, it's not the U.S. Army Watercraft 7 Transportation Group. The funding and maintenance for that comes much higher than them. We're talking about an executive level, we're talking about a flag and general officer level, we're talking about a congressional level, federal level. And that's where the problem lies. It's not with the crews who are forced to make do with this. They are doing yeoman work trying to get ships deployed. Nobody should be surprised that the Bobo had an engine problem on a ship that is 40 friggin' years old and has been deployed for 35 plus years at sea. The time span for ships is usually around 25 to 30 years. And if you use a ship ex a lot, Expect that the end life to be coming sooner rather than later. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon where you can become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Till our next episode, Sal signing off.